Welcome to Service Academy Night. We're gonna take a few seconds just to let everyone join the webinar. I am Kelly Gualtieri from Maine Maritime Academy. I am the Director of Admissions and Enrollment Management. Um, we have a very thorough event planned for tonight. Um, I still see people joining, so come on in. And welcome. We'll just wait a little bit longer. Okay, so welcome again. My name is Kelly Ann Gualtieri. I'm the Director of Admissions and Enrollment Management at Maine Maritime Academy. Um, we, we are here for Service Academy Night. Um, we have a lot of um, people from both um, the congressional offices, senators, um, as well as all of the different service opportunities here in Maine. Um, and some that you can take outside of the state of Maine. We always like to start this event with the playing of our national anthem. So if you can give me one second, please join us for the national anthem. Oh, see, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets were glad, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? <clears throat> I'd now like to turn it over to Major General um, Farnham. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. I, uh, first of all, I just, I want to, uh, thank, uh, the congressional delegation staff, uh, that's on tonight and it's always a big part of this. And, uh, and so I know a lot of the uh, folks that are tuning in don't, uh, are here to hear what they have to say, but, uh, this is, uh, so they've got some great information, but more than that, it's just so important that here in Maine, that the staff works together so closely to help uh, our main uh, candidates get into service academies. Uh, beyond that, Maine Maritime Academy and Kelly been doing this for a long, a lot of, a lot of years. And what a great opportunity uh, you're providing that the uh, students in Maine to get a glimpse at all the different ways to service. The service academies, as you'll hear tonight, are just one uh, one way uh, to serve. But there are so many other options and, and we've got a lot of folks here tonight and, and I recognize a lot of these faces too that have been doing this for a long time. Uh, but on behalf of uh, the state of Maine and one of the, I've been doing this on behalf of the Air Force Academy for a lot of years, but uh, tonight my main uh, role is as the senior uh, military guy in the state of Maine, uh, still wearing the uniform, is to thank you all for your interest in serving your country. And there's a lot of choices that you have out there, a lot of decisions to make, but the fact that tonight and over these next few months, that one of the things that you're considering uh, is to serve your country is, is so important, especially with the world that's out there now. And it isn't just serving your country, it's deciding that you're gonna be a leader because the one thing that we need going forward is not just, um, engineers and mathematicians and teachers and doctors and nurses and military folks, we need people that are gonna take leadership roles in their community. 
And I think that is one of the things that the military prepares you for as well as or better than a lot of other things. So uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of challenges to a military career and there's a lot of good reasons to do it. But wearing the uniform is one of the more honorable things that you can do and, uh, and just gives you an opportunity to do something more uh, bigger than yourself, a sense, have a sense of purpose in what you're going to do, along with maybe some great benefits that help you pay for an education and, and uh, set yourself up for a different career or an incredible career if you decide to spend you know, 10, 20, 30, 37, whatever it happens to be years in uniform. So uh, thank you for taking the time and, and taking the interest in serving your country. It is so very important and you can't go wrong deciding to wear the uniform representing your country. So I hope you uh, get some great information tonight. Thanks, Kelly. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you, Kelly, and all the participants of this evening's seminar and those attending. We've got a, a great response tonight. That's so good to see. And um, also, congratulations to Maine Maritime Academy. I think, isn't this your 80th year? Um, that's really amazing. So um, congratulations to you on that. We are so happy that we could be here um, to help all those in attendance tonight, the students, and, and of course there are some parents I'm sure out there. Um, and thank you for your interest to the students in pursuing an education at one of the academies and serving our country. Um, a nomination is needed in order to be considered for an appointment at a United States Air Force Academy, military, naval, and Merchant Marine Academy. However, not the Coast Guard Academy. That's the one exception to the Federal Service Academies. Nominations are most commonly obtained through a member of Congress. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here as well as my counterparts from the other offices. And um, I'd like to introduce them at this time if I could. Um, Senator King's office is represented by Katie Fellows and Representative Pingree's office is represented by um, Leslie Merrill and Pam Trinwood. They're here uh, on the call tonight. And Representative Golden is represented by Kim Rohn. She's here with us. And we all um, handle the congressional nomination application process for our members. And that's why we're here talking to you tonight. Um, members of Congress are part of the process um, if you're wondering, because they um, ensure that every state and district is equally represented in the uh, appointment process. And um, other nomination sources include the president, vice president, or secretary of military branch. Um, so there are other sources, but we advise that you do apply to your member of Congress um, when you are considering applying for an academy. And to apply, you'll need to be at least 17 and no older than 23 by July 1 of the year that you would be admitted to an academy. And that would be next summer if you're in this current cycle. We are often asked what strengths are important when we consider a candidate's application for a nomination. And they are character, scholarship, leadership, physical aptitude, and also motivation to attend an academy and serve as an officer in the armed forces. If you do decide to apply, we begin accepting nominations as early or the applications as early as May 15. And the deadline to complete your application is October 30th. And that's across the board for each uh, member of Congress, each member of the delegation in Maine. So we try to keep it simple and have the same deadlines and the same requirements. And those requirements are for your uh, application are a letter of intent, and that is a letter that you would write to the member explaining what your motivation is for applying to a particular academy or more than one if you're applying to more than one academy. And that's something, it's not a form letter, there's no template for it. Um, it's something that's really individual to each student that's applying. And then it would be your list of extracurricular activities or resume. And that's everything that you're doing outside of school or the special activities you're doing connected to school. Um, and also they can be employment jobs that you're doing or um, if you're um, 
active in your church or in your community, please mention those things as well. Those are helpful to know. And then um, your letters of recommendation, we require three, we all do. And um, we require at least one of those letters would be from a school official or teacher, um, such as guidance counselor, principal, dean, uh, teacher, coach. Um, and I think Senator King's office requires that at least one letter be from outside school. So our, that's where we differ a little bit in our requirements, but that's, I think, the only exception. And then your transcript, um, we do need it to be signed and dated to be considered official. Um, now, there's uh, an interesting situation with standardized test scores. Last year, I think across the board, pretty much it was test optional as far as the requirement. This year, um, a couple of the academies are requiring that uh, standardized test scores be submitted as part of the application. I believe that's West Point and the Merchant Marine Academy. As far as I know right now, the Air Force Academy and Naval Academy are still evaluating what they're going to do for the class of 2026. Um, and the transcript, um, we do need it to be signed and dated. I'm sorry, I have a question. Okay. Um, so, um, what, we, what the congressional offices are doing right now, as far as our own requirements, normally we would require that um, students would submit their SAT and or ACT scores. So right now, because of the circumstances with COVID, um, we are being flexible on that requirement. Um, so tests are optional. However, um, I want to just recommend that students stay in touch with the academies and make sure they understand the requirement at the academy. Um, so if we're test flexible, but you're applying to West Point, they require SAT or ACT scores, make sure you try to test, um, get those scores and get them in. And we would, we would, of course, if you're testing, we would like to see your test scores because they're very helpful to our screening committees who will be reviewing your application materials and interviewing you in the fall. Um, so apply to each senator in Maine and your representative for your congressional district um, and members of Congress. The reason you want to apply to several members and not just one is that members of Congress are limited to 10 nominations per academy. Um, that would be 10 nominees that they can submit on a slate to each academy. So it's a very, very competitive process, but we do work collaboratively um, to ensure that as many qualified candidates as possible have a chance to be considered for an appointment. So uh, when you apply for nomination, make sure to apply to the academy or the academies of your choice. At the same time, these are separate but simultaneous application processes. And we encourage you to call or email us anytime you have questions or you wanna check on the status of your application if you have applied. Um, and interviews do take place um, for everyone that's completed an application. They'll take place on uh, a day in the fall. And traditionally that's been the Saturday before Thanksgiving. And we will of course notify everyone that has completed their application um, after that application deadline, which again is October 30th, we'll notify you of the application date and the time of your interview and all those details. If something does come up during the year and you absolutely can't make that date for some important reason, um, then we do try to work with you to schedule an individual interview. Um, it would be in advance of the interview day for all the candidates because those interviews are all going to be on that one day. So we will do our best to work with students if they have a football championship or something that, you know, family matter that just something can't be avoided. We really do try to work with you. But um, other than that, I, I'm, um, I'm finished, I think, with what I had to say, and I'm happy to take a question at this time or at the end, whatever um, folks would like to do. Thank you. Sarah, guys. Sarah it's Leslie. Um, I would just encourage um, the applicants to go ahead and open a file if they know they want to attend one of the academies. Don't wait until you have absolutely everything. You can submit things over time. Thank you, that's a great suggestion. So Leslie just answered one of the questions, but um, the other question that we have, um, does the congressional offices accept super scores of the standard, standardized tests? A super score. So your highest math, highest verbal, if you took, if you take it multiple times. Oh, okay, thank you. I hadn't heard 
super score before. <laughs> um, absolutely, if you take tests several times, we take the highest score of each individual subject matter. Absolutely, it's a great question. So it looks like those are all the questions. And next up, West Point. That's me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. I do have a slide. Uh, so, good evening. I'm Angela Armstrong. I'm a field force representative for the United States Military Academy. Um, specifically for District 2, I'm the District 2 coordinator. We also have Chris Casey, who's the state coordinator, and Lieutenant Colonel Scott Wells, who's the District 1 coordinator. You can reach out to us at any time about West Point and uh, as you navigate the admissions process. West Point is the oldest continuously occupied military post in America, dating way back to the Revolutionary War. And the United States Military uh, Academy was established at West Point in 1802. Our mission is to educate, train, and inspire the Corps of Cadets so that each graduate is a commissioned leader of character committed to the values of duty, honor, country, and prepared for a career of professional excellence and service to the nation as an officer in the United States Army. So basically we accomplish this mission um, in a four year program that integrates uh, character, <clears throat> excuse me, academics, military and physical programs. And that all starts with the admissions process. And you can visit westpoint.edu. There's all kinds of information there, of course. There's an eight step um, plan for applying to West Point. And of course, I don't have time tonight to go into that whole eight step process. Um, but I would like to, to stress three points with you. And the first one is if you have the opportunity to attend the summer leader experience during the summer between your junior and senior year of high school, I highly recommend you do it. It's a, it's a four day program usually held at West Point. Unfortunately, right now it's, it is being held virtually due to the pandemic but it immerses you into um, the academic, military, physical, and social life um, uh, of a cadet. And so if you're a junior now and you didn't already apply, the window has closed for, for this summer. Um, if you already did that, good job. Um, and if you're not a junior yet, make sure you keep SLE on your radar screen and apply, the time frame is typically January to March of your junior year. Um, my second point is utilize your field force rep. Um, that's why we're here. We can answer your questions. We can provide guidance during the admissions process. And in fact, there's now a requirement um, in the candidate's uh, application file of an interview and the field force reps conduct those interviews. So make sure you, you reach out to us whenever you need us. Um, and finally, and most importantly, and I think you might hear this a lot tonight is if, if you're thinking about applying to an academy, start the process early. It's an extremely extensive process that takes months to complete. You already just heard from Sarah um, about the congressional nomination process. There's, you know, take your SATs and ACTs early and often to get that super score. Um, you have medical exams, fitness assessment, assessments, and then of course it's it's very um, competitive. And during you know West Point's application cycle, we we re receive over uh, or we we have about fifteen thousand applicants um, start a file uh, at the beginning of the cycle, and only one thousand approximately one thousand two hundred and fifty actually gain admission and show up on. Uh, as a new cadet on our day. So the earlier you get your admission admissions file complete, uh, the better positioned you are uh, to receive uh, an appointment from West Point. And, you know, I just want to point out my slide here. Will it be easy? No, it's not going to be easy. <laughs> um, but I can promise you that it's absolutely worth it. Um, I know from experience, I'm a 1995 graduate. And um, 
be happy to speak with you further off um, about West Point offline. And those two young ladies there on that screen are, um, are my daughters on their R days. One is a Cal right now, which is a junior. And the other one, as you can see, is a plebe. She st started last year during the pandemic. Um, and they also would be happy to talk to you um, about what is you know, going on there right now. So um, I'd like to offer that up as an option. And that's all I have. Thanks a lot. I'll stop. There we go. Angela, we do have a question that's specific to West Point, um, and they're asking about a summer program for students, specifically after their sophomore year, um, but uh, her older brother attended one at the Naval Academy. So um, can you can you just speak to the summer programs? I'm not sure if you know if they're running this year or this summer. Well, the, the one that I'm most familiar with that she might be refer or he or she might be referring to is um, the summer leader experience, which is the one I, I mentioned in my briefing. That is typically done this summer between your junior and senior year. I know there's some STEM programs that you can attend during the summer, um, but that is the program um, that you'd probably be most interested in. It is not happening at West Point this year. It is, they just made the decision to hold it virtually this year. Um, my daughter's class, when she was right before her senior year, was the last one to, to go actually to the academy to hold it. Since then, they've been held virtually. Hopefully, we're getting back to in-person again soon. Thank you. And Sarah, can we just answer one question um, before before we move to the Naval Academy, um, just because it's been asked a few times right now. Um, what weight does the congressional delegations put on involvement in activities such as JROTC and Civil Air Patrol? Oh. Unmute first. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I think that I, I, I'm not sure I can answer what kind of weight that really would have on an applicant's application. Um, I think that we like to see a well-balanced individual. So I think those, those are really important um, kinds of activities. However, I think that um, our screening committee, they're the ones that are going to be evaluating and making the recommendation on the um, applications. And I think um, that they're going to look at everything a student does. And certainly those are very important. I think that they're going to be helpful and show um, an avid interest and motivation on that kind of a path um, to service the country. But uh, if a student has not, um, hasn't taken a, an opportunity like that, I don't think it's necessarily going to hurt them. Um, but I think leadership um, that a student shows is going to be very important. They really like to see leadership. And if it's with your community and your school, um, any other activity, that's going to be especially helpful. So that's a great question. Thank you. Okay, and next let's move on to Jen. Um, for the Service Academy questions, we'll probably, um, I think we'll just hit them all up because I, I know that um, each academy can then answer about their summer programs and the other things. So if you can just hold hold fast or type your questions in, but we will get to them. Jen? Thank you very much. Uh, there is a part of me that can't help, but uh, this is not a dig on Kelly, but I can't help but think that how great to go after West Point, but before Air Force, just so everyone makes sure to remember um, the service that has it um, all together, although I know General Harnum um, will pay me back for that after this. Uh, my name is Jen Till and I am a 2001 grad from the Naval Academy. Very similar to Angela's brief, um, I am the coordinator for the Blue and Gold Officers here in Maine and there are a couple other Blue and Gold Officers on this call. So we have ones both from the North and the South. So as people ask questions, we'll hopefully jump in there and answer questions for that. Um, there are a couple things. I don't have any slides. I don't wanna reiterate what I know you can find on the website. So there are lots of questions, but I do wanna reiterate a couple things that has been said in the capacity of 
Thank you for even your willingness to serve our country. It's really an amazing gift to all of those people around you. Um, and it will be a gift that is given to you. Once you see, or if it's the path you choose, um, their experiences you will never have again. So um, in that, I will say you have to do it for you. So I know mom and dad might be excited about it or you have siblings that do it, but this is definitely an experience that you will have to do for yourself. And so just keep that in mind as you go along um, that if it's something that you think you might want, continue with this, like try everything you can. I know that West Point already talked about their, their summer leadership experience. Both Air Force Academy and Naval Academy both have what is called summer seminar. And I strongly encourage you to apply to all of them. So regrettably, we've just missed the window for the Naval Academy that ended on March 31st. Um, but I encourage you as you get older, especially for the sophomores and the juniors out or the sophomores and the freshmen out there, look at all of those experiences, see everything you can see before you make a decision um, and ask a ton of questions. That's what we are all here for. We are here to help you in any way that we possibly can and to answer whatever questions we can. So ask away. It's not a normal application. Um, that's what makes serving in the military and serving at these institutions not normal and amazing. So let us help you down those paths and that's what we're for. So there's no silly question um, either for you or for your parents. So just ask away. Um, and then I will close out with this um, in that from, I think anyone who has served in the military will agree, the absolute best part about going to a military academy is the people. You will have friends for life and they will be your friends forever. Um, as we know, we live in here in Maine and Maine is the seventh state I've lived in. And I've had 15 classmates visit me in the short time that I've lived here. So it's clearly a destination. We don't live in DC where everyone can just pass through. Um, so it's really a bond and an experience like no other. So I strongly encourage you to look into it if it's what you decide is for you, uh, then ask away and let us help you. That's what we're here for. And go Navy. And next up, Air Force Academy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Brendan Wood. I'm an admissions advisor with the Air Force Academy in charge of the New England region. I'm also a recent graduate from the USAFA class of 20. We are very fortunate and happy that last year our graduating class was still able to have an in-person graduation, have the Air Force Thunderbirds fly overhead, something that we will continue to cherish um, and just be thankful for, you know, given the, the times during the pandemic. I will say coming out of high school, I wanted nothing to do with the military. And I, and I only say that because I thought I had it all figured out. Um, on top of that, I knew very little about the military. And so for you all to be here today, learning about the service academies and the opportunities to serve, um, it's awesome for a few reasons. One, you know, there's not that many people that do want to stand up today and volunteer to serve in our nation. I think that's awesome. And two, these are great opportunities to find out more information about the service academies and about the different branches of the military so that you can make the best decisions moving forward. I actually, I was pretty decent in track and field. And when I was in high school, I got a recruiting letter in the mail from the Naval Academy, as it turns out. Um, but when I went online and tried to learn about, you know, more about maybe what it would take to apply, um, I thought, man, I do not have the grades to get in. Um, now I'm sitting on this side, an academy graduate, uh, realizing that there's also way more to applying to service academies than just your academic background as well. Um, so, you know, do take that into consideration if you haven't already done so. And because of that, I ended up enlisting in the Air Force. I had the opportunity to apply to the academy as a prior enlisted airman. Um, and if there's anything I can get across to you all today is that there's many different ways to, you know, achieve whatever goal that is that you are seeking out, whether it is to get into one of these service academies or to serve in one of our armed forces or military branches. You know, there are many ways to achieve that. And so understand that, you know, sometimes we can be very narrow minded and narrow sighted. Um, but at the end of the day, if you do uh, decide to apply to any and all of these great institutions and service academies, you know, you're going to have a great career ahead of you, you know, upon your appointments to each and every one of those. And um, please ask questions today. I hope that 
you know, we can't answer any and all of your questions. And I hope that at least my perspective is, you know, a bit relatable to maybe you all as you are looking to apply to some of these service academies. So thank you. All righty, good afternoon, or I guess evening now, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Junior Grade Emily Torsney. As you can tell, my coffee level is running a little low, so I apologize. I am the Northeast Admissions Officer at the United States Coast Guard Academy, which is located in beautiful New London, Connecticut. I'm gonna go ahead, I do have one slide that I want to show. So just a couple of things I like to showcase about the United States Coast Guard Academy. We are one of the federal service academies. However, we are a little bit different than our fellow service academies in terms of the academy itself and our mission. So as I mentioned, we are located in Connecticut, nestled in between New York City, Boston, Massachusetts, and Hartford, Connecticut. So kind of in the epicenter of New England. Not as gorgeous as Maine, I will say that. I'm biased to Maine, my husband's family's from Maine. So I will say at least I get to be in the Northeast region and get to connect with students such as yourself and visit on occasion. Uh, the academy itself is smaller than the other service academies, a little under 1100 enrolled. So if you're looking for that smaller size, that's where the Coast Guard Academy may be an interest to you. Before I go on about the Coast Guard Academy itself, I wanna focus on the Coast Guard as a service. Uh, because we, once again, do have a couple of differences. So instead of Department of Defense, the Coast Guard falls under the Department of Homeland Security. What does that mean? It means that we focus on a humanitarian mission. So we have 11 statutory missions that fall under that humanitarian umbrella. And that can be anywhere from your classic, um, you know, I know a lot of the different movies and books out there, you see Coast Guards, uh, individual Coast Guards, men and women jumping out of helicopters into the water and conducting search and rescue. And that's absolutely something we do. Um, however, we also do maritime security, marine and environmental protection, uh, ice operations. We do migrant and drug interdiction and a number of other um, important industry related items such as maintaining the marine transportation system as well as you know our coastal waterways. And in addition to doing all this, we also have flight school opportunities. So if you are interested in becoming a pilot, the Coast Guard Academy is a way to do so as well. And we do have a number of postgraduate opportunities too. So plenty of room for growth within the Coast Guard itself, just as with all of our other service academies. And I do have to agree that probably one of the biggest staples of our service, as well as the other services, is the fact that you go on to make lifelong bonds and careers. Um, so you're going to have people, I have made so many friends through my service, and I'm so grateful to that. So not only do you get to live for a great cause and a great mission, but you have a support system throughout it, and it's truly a family. Coast Guard Academy itself, we have nine academic majors, five of which are engineering-based, and then we also have management and government. You do get a Bachelor of Science, uh, 26 varsity sports at the D3 level, with the exception of sailing, rifle, and pistol, which are D1. Over 50 cadet activities all on the website. You can explore it further. If we don't have it, you can start it. You just need an adult such as myself to get you going. We also have a number of leadership and professional development programs. So the mission of the Coast Guard Academy is to develop leaders of character. I know these are ping words. You've been hearing them all night. Um, who embody our core values of honor, respect, and devotion to duty. We also have a number of summer training programs that we get you involved with once you're at the academy that expose you to the fleet and put you in leadership positions, training other cadets. Uh, and then two things to note, no congressional nomination to apply to the Coast Guard Academy. Once again, another difference. And then my favorite statistic I like to share is our 85% graduate retention. Now, this is not the percentage of students who graduate upon entering the academy. This is the number of students who after serving their five-year service obligation upon commissioning from the academy, they opt to stay in past those five years. So they opt to serve in the Coast Guard longer than their uh, service obligation is. So I think it's a huge testament to our service as a whole and the career satisfaction. A couple things to know. Our application is 100% online and I'm your primary resource throughout the entire process. So I will link my information in the chat box below, but you reach out if you have any questions and I'm here for you. That's Literally why I love my job so much is because I get to connect with students such as yourself. 
We also do have a summer program. It's our Academy Introduction Mission. It's for rising seniors. Applications are still open. So you do have time. You have two days. So it does close on the 15th. So if you want to go ahead and put together real quick, you can. Everything's on our website. And right now we're looking to do three separate weeks. One is virtual and two are still scheduled for in-person. So pending the COVID pandemic, we will see if we opt to switch that to virtual or not. But right now it is still in person. So like I said, happy to assist in any way possible. It does have to be your decision. So I'm here to help you be informed in doing so and hope that we get to connect here in the future. So with that being said, I'll go ahead. That's all I have this evening. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, John Murphy. I'm a 1987 graduate of the United States Merchant Marine Academy. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to share a, a slide with you here for a second. Maybe not. Sorry, it's not working. So I'll just go ahead. Um, the United States Merchant Marine Academy is located in Kings Point, New York. It is on the North Shore of Long Island, an 80-acre campus. It is, as we've said, one of the five federal service academies. And as such, you are required to have the congressional nomination that we spoke about and also apply to the academy. Those are two parallel application processes. Um, the mission of the United States Merchant Marine Academy is to train uh, young men and women as officers in the Merchant Marine to work on civilian commercial ships. And that is something that I have done since graduation. I have over 33 years sailing on a commercial ship. I'm the chief engineer on a, a merchant ship um, that travels back and forth between uh, the US and, and Europe. Um, graduating from the Merchant Marine Academy, you will get a BS degree in marine engineering or marine transportation. You'll get your Coast Guard license to sail on these merchant ships and also a, a reserve commission in the United States Navy. You have an option to join any branch of the military um, upon graduation and go active in, in that branch. And that will also fulfill your commitment. Um, part of your training at Kings Point is a seer. And this is a very unique to Kings Point where you go and you work on a commercial ship you um, usually go in pairs, one deck, one engine, and you would spend um, two sea periods at sea for a total of about 300 days in your four years of education. So it's a very um, action-filled four years. You don't have much vacation, very brief summer vacation, um, because you do have a full academic schedule and have to also um, fulfill that CEO requirement. So <clears throat> upon graduation, um, you will work in the Merchant Marine at sea. You can work um, in a government GS job or be active duty in any branch of the military. Uh, one thing that um, is unique to uh, King's Point is there are, each state is allotted a specific number of seats in, in the class. Our class sizes are, are a little smaller, similar to Coast Guard, about 275 in each class. And Maine has two guaranteed seats in each class. And um, sadly, the last two years, we have not met that quota. So um, please, if you're interested, uh, apply because there is opportunity for a seat at, at the Merchant Marine Academy. Um, <clears throat> I will uh, put my contact information in, in the chat. And as has been said multiple times, but I would repeat it tonight, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, juniors, this is the time to start. As it was said, May 15th, you can start your application with congressional nomination. And also at King's Point, you can start that online. And I'll also list the uh, school's uh, website and you can do that online also. So again, thank you and uh, look forward to hearing from you. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us tonight. My name is Lieutenant Ian Gray, and I am one of the ROTC advisors at the Navy ROTC unit at Maine Maritime Academy and the University of Maine. And I will also be filling in for my colleague, Lieutenant Ryan Armstrong, who is our Strategic Sealift Midshipman um, Program Coordinator 
at Maine Maritime Academy. Um, so you may have heard of that program. It's unique to the uh, Maritime Academies, but we'll get more into that in a second. Okay, so a little bit about myself. I'm a submarine warfare officer, um, did a few years on submarines, and now this is my shore duty. Uh, and at an NROTC unit, um, I serve as an advisor, and this is one of the pathways to earn a commission into the Navy. So just like the service academies, NROTC is another avenue to feed um, yourself into the Navy and become a commissioned officer in the Navy or Marine Corps. So it's a pretty diverse force, as you can see. We have a lot of different communities, surface warfare, driving ships, submarines, what I did, aviation, special warfare, EOD, Marine Corps. Um, so there are plenty of different options that you will get a good overview of so you can make an educated preference once you uh, get, are getting close, closer to graduation so you can enter into the community that um, you desire. There are a few different types of scholarships that we offer. So the big one is the national scholarship. So this is a four-year scholarship that covers tuition, fees, room and board. And that scholarship is applied uh, for through the Naval Service Training Command. And that scholarship actually shares some components with the Naval Academy. Um, so a lot of uh, students will choose to apply it to both the Naval Academy and NROTC units around the country as well. It's fairly competitive. It's not gonna be as competitive as a service academy, uh, but that is a pretty competitive scholarship. You can, you know, you understand that there's a huge, um, you know, financial benefit with all four years completely paid for. Um, but we do have other options that are slightly less competitive and, you know, they come with um, also a great deal of financial assistance. So those are our three and two year scholarships they are also called sideload scholarships. These you would apply for after you join the unit, not on scholarship. And if you are awarded one of these scholarships, it would pay for tuition and fees for three years, two years, however many years you have remaining in the program. And more info on all of those scholarships, their deadlines can be found online. Uh, but for the juniors out there, the National Scholarship window is open. Um, you can find a link to that on the website that you see linked there. It, it opened at the beginning of April and it will um, close January 31st. Uh, so definitely, just like a service academy application, there are a lot of components to it. So I would recommend that you apply early. So. What does a, you know, what kind of commitments do you have as a midshipman in the ROTC program, in addition to your commitments as a student or a member of the regiment? Well, you're going to be taking one naval science course per semester, a three credit course. You'll be participating in physical training in the morning. And the amount of mornings that you owe to us each week depends on how you're performing on your physical fitness tests. Uh, so that could be anywhere from one to three mornings per week. And then you also have a Naval Science Lab uh, one afternoon per week. So those are your regular commitments. Uh, so it might sound like a lot, but we do have um, varsity athletes that are members of the unit. So, you know, with some time management skills, it, it's definitely doable. Some occasional commitments also come up on the weekend. So for instance, this past weekend, we had an FTX, a field training exercise. So the bottom left picture, that's a FTX from um, last year. And it's going, you're, if you're a Marine option, you're going to participate in that. And we also have uh, roles available to Navy options as well that can participate in FTXs. And actually this upcoming weekend, we have the Zimmerman Fitness Challenge, which is unfortunately going to be virtual this year, but that is, um, that is always a fun time. You're gonna be super sore afterward, uh, but it's, it's for a very good cause. Okay, and so that we can help you make an informed preference for your uh, service assignment when you commission, 
you know, whether you're driving ships, submarines, flying planes, we also send you on summer training every summer. So one month, uh, about three weeks over the summer, you're going to be doing uh, professional training, um, spending time with an aviation squadron on a submarine, on board a ship, um, on a Marine Corps base, just getting to know what these different communities have to offer. So with that, I'll uh, move over to the other side of the house. So this is a program that's unique to maritime academies and that's a strategic sea lift midshipman program. Um, so if you wanna be a strategic sea lift midshipman, this leads to a commission in the Navy, just like the ROTC one, but this is gonna be a reserve commission. So um, it's not going to be your primary job when you get out, you're going to be in the Naval Reserve. So you'll maintain a job elsewhere in the maritime industry. Um, hopefully sailing, they like you to, uh, you know, have uh, maintained time out at sea because the idea is that you're going to support the Navy if the need ever came, um, you know, in, in the event of a war to resupply the warfighter out there. So you're going to be operating ships in the military sea lift command uh, so that you know we can um, you know get the supplies where they need to go so this is a again a reserve commission so it won't be your primary job uh, you'll generally do two weeks of active duty time per year um, so because it's you know less of a commitment there's also uh, you know less financial incentive for it. So right now it's $32,000 over four years. So it's, you know, it's significant. Um, and I think that, you know, it's worthwhile if you plan to be sailing uh, for those two weeks of active duty time required per year. Um, so you have to maintain your Coast Guard license uh, for eight years, and you'll be doing those two weeks per year. Um, and this program, again, it's unique to Maritime Academies. And it's a great option if you want to serve your country, but you're not um, you're not sure that you want to make it your full time job. You know, maybe you want to pursue some other opportunities in the maritime industry. So I will also drop my email address if you missed it on the first slide in the chat below, and you can contact myself or Lieutenant Armstrong as a strategic sea lift officer if you have questions about this program. Thank you. Next up I think is Army ROTC. All right, thank you very much. I wasn't sure if uh, SSOP was going to go in. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a second. Great. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Vivas from the University of Maine Army ROTC uh, here up in Orono, and we've got two institutions with us. We've got uh, Army ROTC here at UMaine, as well as Huston University. Uh, on the other side, I'm a Norwich graduate, so I, I did have some time in a senior military college. And Jen, fun fact, I attended the Navy Summer Seminar 20 years ago. And so I, I have a broad, uh, you know, touch in all the services. And uh, sir, I never uh, served in the Air Force, so I'm, I'm, I'm missing there. But uh, special thanks to Maine Maritime for hosting today. And uh, General Farm, sir, your guidance and the Guard's continuing support of our program. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be very quick here. So we are Maine. Okay, we're the, we're the flagship school here uh, within uh, the state of Maine and our students range from all over this great state. Uh, and then our return on investment as they go back and serve uh, majority 70% of them back into the state. Although we do have folks that compete for active duty. Uh, but we also have folks across the country too. We've got students from California, New Jersey uh, and everywhere else in between. So uh, we, we do have a, uh, a, a broad range of students. Uh, we consider ourselves a leadership factory and for those who don't know about ROTC we're the reserve officer training corps uh, we do have active duty soldiers we also have reserve and guard uh, folks that enter uh, and ours is more of a national based scholarship and so for those that are out there and I'll talk about this in one of the slides uh, coming up 
is that we offer uh, four-year scholarships that, that are national based. So as you out there uh, compete, uh, you have three chances during the course of the year uh, in October, January, and March to apply for scholarship boards. And then you're selected or if selected, it's a four-year process. Now for the service academies out there as well, a lot of our folks that, uh, that uh, go for these national scholarships also apply to West Point, Air Force Academy, and the Naval Academy. And where we offer this is, uh, you know, we have some folks that, uh, that maybe apply for the Naval Academy, maybe apply for West Point and don't get in for whatever reason due to the highly competitive nature of those organizations. Uh, and they come to us, right? But that doesn't end your dream to go to the service academies, okay? I actually have one student uh, who is a four-year national scholarship uh, winner that we supported, wrote letters of recommendations for here, and he's actually exiting our program to go chase his dream at West Point. So we're unselfish up here. We want to support everybody's uh, goals and ambitions. Uh, and so if that occurs and you find yourself within the halls of Orono and you want to go to a service academy, I will do everything in my power to get you to your, uh, to your dream. Um, our scholarship program begins and ends, like we said, at your junior year. So, so as you're as you're kind of or begins at your junior year. So, as you're navigating this process, Mr. Fahey's on the line too. We'll put his uh, information into the box. Um, we're a small family program. Okay, I'm excited to be in the great state of Maine, and and and, and uh, you know where we where we have a, a smaller pool, about 80 to 90 cadets within our program. We have varsity athletes that are within our halls. We have nurses uh, that enter the armed services. Uh, and like we talked about the uh, service academy resupply support um, on that too uh, we we offer uh, one to four credit courses throughout the course of your time here as well as physical training and uh, leadership laboratories uh, and, and other events and like the navy rotc who's our neighbor uh, right down the street uh, we offer similar uh, career paths within to the service um, that being said i'll just go to the next slide and i'll be quick on these uh, so this is the national scholarship uh, application process. These are a little bit of what you see in front of you, uh, the standards to apply, uh, as well as the uh, apply online here at the, the website. Scholarship benefits. Okay, we, we normally receive three to four national scholarship winners uh, a year that apply to the University of Maine, but there are other ways to get scholarships within our program, uh, which are called campus-based scholarships. And those are ones that are awarded uh, throughout maybe a four year, three year, or even two year. Uh, and we're able to, to uh, award those on campus here uh, if money allows. Regardless of anything though, if you do contract with us, and that means you want to sign up to join the Army, you don't have to make that decision really until the end of your junior year. And by doing so, uh, you can start to accumulate $420 a month. So there is benefits out there if you're a non-scholarship. I was non-scholarship, uh, went through the traditional track and, and ended up uh, uh, receiving a stipend as we as we went. Uh, just here, service commitment. Again, if you're active duty, four years uh, of your scholarship. So you do four years and four years in active ready reserve, which means you can go on, go into the guard, go into the reserves. Uh, you can go get a job outside the army. And if need be, inactive ready reserve means you're on a call list in the event that, uh, uh, that we needed to activate that. Uh, or if you're non-scholarship, like I was, it was three years traditional and then five years in active ready reserve. Uh, and then the reserve components uh, you see down there is eight years uh, guard and reserve um, for, for a, a GFRD scholarship. So I know I covered a lot of things here and I just want to close on, uh, you know, we have a lot of great opportunities and there's career tracks as you get into the service, whether it's service academies or whether it's ROTC, but we all attend that that same end state of putting officers into the United States uh, service. So anything we can do to help you out, uh, I know Mr. Fahey is going to put his uh, his information into the chat box and please feel free to, uh, to, to ask us. And if you are in the state of Maine and you stop by our office and you need help, Service Academy or anything else, please uh, please let us know we're here. And I can talk Norwich because I'm going to have to send a note to Norwich for not being on the line either. So I got them. So any uh, questions I'll answer at the end. Thank you very much. And uh, I should be followed by. Stop sharing my screen. Brendan, do you want to say a few words about Citadel? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. So uh, my name is Brendan Fahey. Uh, this is my first time recruiting for the Citadel. Uh, I am the scholarship and enrollment advisor recruiter for the Humane Army ROTC program. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you high school students 
expressing an interest in the uh, Naval Academies and all the academies. Uh, my personal story is this. I applied to the Naval Academy and I did not get accepted. So my plan B was to attend the Citadel Army ROTC. And uh, I had a great, great four years at the Citadel. Uh, actually, after one semester, I ended up in Army ROTC. Uh, the end of the day, we're all four-year programs and we're all commissioned as junior officers into whatever service we have selected. So for me, I was a helicopter pilot. I did it for 27 years in the Army. I have absolutely no regrets. Um, so I can help you just to reiterate a couple of things, uh, and then I'll talk about the Citadel. Uh, one of the earlier panelists talked about starting the application process early. I cannot emphasize that enough. You are all rock stars going into your senior year, and you will need as much time as possible. Uh, in the summertime, I recommend you complete your application as early as possible. Uh, and that's for all of you juniors that are getting ready. Once you finish your school year, start the application process. Um, you're going to be busy, busy people in your senior year of college. Get this done with as, as much as possible. Uh, I will help you with anything on the ROTC scholarship for Army ROTC. Now, back to my alma mater, the Citadel. It's a military college. Uh, it's a state college in South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. It is an absolutely beautiful campus. They have wonderful educational programs and you will be a cadet in the Corps of Cadets. There's no option for that. Whether you're joining the military or not, if you, you don't have to sign a contract to go on any of the services upon graduation, but you will participate in the military regimentation um, that's provided by the Corps of Cadets. So it'll be just like walking into VMI, Norwich, um, or, or walking into the academies, you really won't see much of a difference. Um, but anyhow, Charleston is a beautiful city. Um, they, the Citadel also has all four ROTC programs. So you can go Navy slash Marine Corps, Air Force uh, or Army, uh, which is what I did. Or you can go straight civilian. You walk off that stage four years after you started and uh, you can be uh, a civilian full time <clears throat> with just a wonderful self-discipline that was provided to you, uh, instilled in you, uh, going through the Corps of Cadets uh, military uh, system at the Citadel. Uh, I can answer any questions on that as well. Uh, the, the gentleman, Craig, who usually does this, uh, was unable to make it this evening. But uh, that's pretty much all I have. So if you have any questions uh, about the Citadel, and certainly you, Maine and Hassan, uh, you, you reach out to me. I've got my name over there. Uh, I have my, all my contact information. Again, it's Brendan Fahey with the University of Maine. Uh, I wish you all the best of luck in your efforts, uh, both in high school and in your application processes. Thank you. VMI. All right. Um, hey everyone, my name is Chase Perry. I'm Assistant Director of Admissions at VMI. Um, we are very similar to the Citadel, probably the most um, similar school um, out there to us is the Citadel, um, both four-year um, four military colleges. Again, um, just like Brennan said, we are optional commissioning. Um, all of our students participate in our Corps of Cadets, whether they're commissioning or not, and it is a four-year program. Um, they participate in an RTC program um, it's a graduation requirement, just like a math or a science would be at a normal school. However, um, about 60% of our students are commissioning upon graduation. Um, so a high, high number of those. Um, we do offer 14 different majors, so we're considerably smaller um, than a lot of the other military schools that you're going to look at. It's only 1,700 students, 10 to 1 student teacher ratio. Um, Kind of that small liberal arts college feel along with the military size um it, it's very rare to have those in the same place kind of and, and we we do that a little bit differently and that's probably our biggest difference there um and i will re reiterate um what everyone has said is make sure you get your application in early um whether you are applying to the academies and then waiting to look at one of the senior military colleges afterwards don't wait until you hear back from the academies um inevitably we have we had a young man called a day that was waiting to hear back um, and is kind of having 
kind of having some fears that he may not get into the academy and he wants to apply to VMI. And the best we can do at this point, he's going to be on our wait list. So make sure you get a, you get um, your application into all the different schools. Um, don't just put all your eggs in that academy basket because um, it is very competitive. And then, you know, all of our schools here are, are, are competitive. But again, every year we have folks that, that do um, that do end up in that situation. So that's my one big piece of advice is to look at your different schools um, and, and, and get a, get multiple plans together. Um, and, and that's, that's the main thing. And we'll, we'll be here to answer any questions. So. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Sergeant Patterson of the Maine Army National Guard. And uh, I think I'm just I'm gonna reiterate some of the stuff that all these great leaders have already told you, but tonight's all about getting information so that you can make informed decisions. And we go make some assumptions that everybody that's here tonight, you want to, you want to serve and, and you, want to, you want to be leaders. So the, the Guard can help with that in many ways. It's not the path, but it's a path like everybody else is speaking to tonight. Um, and we like to think that the Guard not only does it provide you options, but it adds options uh, that you might not have if you weren't a member of the Guard. Uh, we have cadet ships for West Point. Uh, the last time I checked, which was right before this meeting started, there's 88, 85 cadet ships that are offered to National Guard or Reserve soldiers. And then for other schools to include Maine Maritime Academy, thank you for hosting us tonight. Uh, but if you are a Guard soldier, you are covered under Maine state law that says your tuition after you fill out your FAFSA and get all that money that you don't have to pay back, like your scholarships and grants, Maine state law says that your tuition is covered for wearing this uniform here 39 days out of the year. Uh, so that's Maine Maritime Academy, all of our University of Maine system schools and community colleges, and then there's a few others with some additional details that we would have to go over that would be a lot easier in person and I can't do that in five minutes. So biggest takeaway for me um, or for you as far as I'm concerned I should say is don't hesitate. Make sure that you do have all your options. Make sure they're informed decisions when you make them and don't everybody keeps telling you and I see it year after year do not hesitate. Um, and do not put all of your eggs in one basket because we see it year after year. Somebody puts in, they have this goal in their brain, which is always great, uh, but they, they take one shot at one option and usually sometimes it works out and then other times it doesn't. And then it's, it's panic mode, which is never a time when you want to be making decisions that impact the rest of your life. Um, as far as scholarships and um, becoming a commissioned officer goes, I'm going to hand it over to our new officer strength manager, which is Lieutenant Gibson. And he's going to speak to you all a little bit about our Minuteman scholarships and what those are all about, what they entail, and how many we have to offer this year. LT Gibson. Nice. So thank you, Sharon Patterson. Yep, I am the new officer strength manager for the Maine Army National Guard. I am going to just touch briefly again, you know, I don't want to take up all of your time. Um, so we can offer a couple different scholarship options. We have the Minuteman scholarship, which is a four year or a guaranteed three year scholarship program that um, you can utilize at any of the ROTC programs. So USM, University of Maine, which is my alma mater, I'm a GRFD scholarship recipient and University of Maine graduate. Um, and then, as I said, the GRFD, so GRFD is a Guaranteed Reserve Forces Scholarship, um, which is given in like a two year, to a, a couple different options, but it's all generally the same pool. The Minuteman Scholarship, however, is given, like I said, at the four year or the three year advanced designee to high school seniors. This year, we have six nominations that are handed out by the adjutant general. So Major General Farnham, who is on this evening. Um, three of them are the four year. So it's a full four year scholarship and three are the three year advanced designee. So, you know, going into school, I have three years paid. Um, 
one thing that Sergeant Patterson um, didn't mention that I'm going to is that if you choose to come into the Maine Army National Guard and you accept a Minuteman scholarship or a GRFD scholarship, you can utilize both your educational benefits that the Army National Guard can provide to you and your GRFD scholarship. So the nice thing about the GRFD scholarship is you have the choice to use it for either your tuition or your room and board. So as Sergeant Patterson had mentioned, if you choose to go to a, a main school, so we'll just use Orono as an example, you, you enlist with the Maine Army National Guard, you are, have automatic access to those tuition benefits. That is covered by the tuition benefits and then your room and board is covered by your scholarship. And then on top of that, you have all of the other ROTC benefits that the University of Maine had already spoken about. Um, Again, if you guys have any questions, I will put my information into the chat and we can talk offline and I can talk at length about anything you'd like. Um, as, a, as a graduate of the University of Maine program and you know the National Guard as a whole. So, barring any other questions, I... And next, the Air Guard, Brittany. Hi there. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sergeant McHugh. I'm a recruiter with the Maine Air National Guard. Um, we are the part-time component of the Air Force. So we serve, live and serve right here in Maine. We have two locations um, in Bangor and South Portland. And much like Sergeant Patterson just said, we may not be your first option, but we are an option for you. Um, like I said, we serve one weekend a month two weeks out of the year right here in Maine. So if you're looking to um, potentially just stay in Maine and go to school in Maine, we are a great option. We have 100% tuition um, to Maine Maritime Academy, um, uh, University of Maine System Schools and the community colleges. Um, also, we offer great benefits such as health, retirement plans, paid training, valuable trade skills, and like I said before, the opportunity to serve in your community. Um, we have our information, contact information available if you're on Facebook and Instagram. We have pages on there um, with information that we update. We try to update those pages daily. So if you're looking to reach out to a recruiter, whether you're in the Bangor area or South Portland, you can find our information on there. Thank you. Okay, so again, my name is Kelly Gualtieri. I'm the Director of Admissions and Enrollment Management at Maine Maritime Academy. Um, I actually do have some slides um, just to kind of follow suit. Um, we are um, very unique in terms of, yes, we are a Maine state institution. However, we have a really unique mission. Um, and our mission is all about maritime and marine related fields. Um, but more importantly, what we do um, is we graduate students um, that have the skills, ethics, and knowledge needed to succeed in a global economy. Um, we all unfortunately watched the Evergreen um, clog up the Suez um, over this last uh, few weeks. Um, what our students doing? Uh, what our students do is they move things from place to place, whether it's on a business side, um, logistics, ocean studies, um, and then both the transportation and the engineering side. Um, what you see in front of you is a slide of our students this year on campus. So we are under a thousand students. And the best part about that is where we're located on the coast of Castine, Maine, um, and our small student body um, size really allowed us to manipulate everything so that we could give an in-person or mostly in-person experience. Um, our education cannot be learned online. Um, and it was really important for our students to be in the lab, to be on the vessels. Um, we were even able to um, hold what one of our traditional um, ceremonies, ring night, which is right there in the center of that slide. We also did have some athletic competition. We compete at the D3 level. Um, one of the things that kind of makes us uh, unique too is that um, you know, we do have different service opportunities. Um, and tonight's all about service opportunities. Um, we have a regiment here, um, which similar to Kings Point, you can actually go and serve in the maritime industry in a civilian component. 
Um, and that includes students then who also want to do the SSMP, that Strategic Sealift Midshipman Program that Lieutenant Gray spoke about. We also have Navy ROTC and Marine Corps option, which he also spoke about, um, but those are not limited in terms of majors. So if you want to do an ROTC or the Marine Corps option, you can choose any of our majors as they are all STEM majors. Strategic Sea, strategic sea Lift does require that you are in the unlimited license program, meaning you're going to have a Coast Guard license to sail unlimited tonnage um, on any type of vessel in the world. We also have some Coast Guard options. Um, things like MARGRAD, where you can direct commission into the Coast Guard, and some of our students will do an officer, um, an officer path through OCS. Um, and then, as it was mentioned, um, we are very familiar with the main guard. Sometimes I do um, laugh and joke that they have to have an office on our campus or in my, in my office in admissions, because we do actually work with a lot of our main students and even students out of state who can join the main guard and benefit from some of those opportunities. Um, I know we all want to get to questions, so I'm going to just throw one last slide up there about our world-class hands-on education. Um, so you can see we have a small student-to-faculty ratio, with a, which again came in very handy um, this year with the pandemic. Um, we are looking forward to getting back to, um, you know, real uh, normal um, educational opportunities come this fall. Our students, some of them are right now in quarantine, getting ready um, to go on to summer cruise on our state of Maine ship, um, as well as others are going to co-ops and internships um, around the US and, and the world. Um, we are open for visits, so I will give that little plug um, and with that, I'm going to start um, asking some of the questions that you have had. So you have all been very patiently waiting um, for some of these questions. Um, so if we can start with some of the service academies, maybe just in the order that we presented. Um, one of the first questions were, um, do we recommend the SAT or the ACT um, when, when applying? Either is acceptable at any of the academies, they have, they have a way to um, equal out the scores and, and, and so they'll accept either one. And Angela, the, there was a question about the writing section um, because the SAT is no longer gonna require that. That is a question I do not know the answer to. If they're not going to do it anymore, obviously the academies are not gonna be able to require it if, if it's not gonna be an option. Um, I don't know if, they will come up with something else on their own. Um, but I, I don't know the, um, I hadn't heard that yet. So has anybody else heard about that? I will say from Navy, they have said that they are only going to take what is considered the standard test for the country. So if it's only going to go back to verbal and math, if that's the score that they're going to take and they'll super score from there. I would assume that's the same for West Point. Coast Guard Academy doesn't require it um, at this point in time. So moving forward, it will not make any difference. As well as at the Air Force Academy, just math and uh, English-based reading and writing. King's point is the same we'll super score and take either ACT or SAT. There was also a question about transfer credit. And I know some of you did answer that in the chat. Um, but do you want to all talk about how you um, handle any transfer credit, early college program, um, AP um, tests and, and scores? I'll, I'll take that if you want, Kelly. Uh, so there's a couple of things. Um, I think everyone jumped in on the chat that there's not an automatic transfer of college credits. Almost all of the uh, service academies do validation exams, and those are given the summer um, once you report for I-Day or in-doc or anything else of that nature. So then they're given at some point thereafter uh, before you start the academic year. So um, something else to consider too is if you are um, in college and reapplying to a service academy or in college and applying to the academy for the first time, because we do have those too, please take into consideration what classes you are taking. It should mirror whatever service academy you're looking to attend as closely as it possibly can. So it's not really, they wanna see a math, they wanna see a science, they wanna see an English, not necessarily cramming all your gen ed courses 
Um, and we always joke like underwater fire prevention or basket weaving, those things will not indicate that you are striving to get to a service academy. So, um, and I'll jump in and say that if you are tr trying to transfer from another college, you still will go through the entire four year program at the academy. You don't, your, your prior years do not count <laughs> at the academies in that respect. It counts for good experience, right? Um, I, I think I can speak for, for you, Maine, and for us. Um, you know, we will have a transfer credit evaluation. We accept, you know, APs with certain scores. Um, and that's put into your academic plan, um, you know, in terms of your, your degree. So, Brendan, did you want to add something? No, I, I think you all have pretty much said pretty much the appropriate stuff right there. Um, but I, I want to do emphasize that, you know, the STEM courses are important if that's what you're going to be trying to get college courses on. Or it depends on what major you're pursuing here at the university. If it's engineering, you want some good hard science classes in high school. I will say if I can add one more thing, even if you do, uh, you know, take these entrance exams, you know, when you attend any of the service academies and do well enough to validate any of those courses, there's no graduating early from any of the service academies as well. You're going to make, you're going to go throughout the, the four year, uh, 48 month curriculum that each and every one of those service academies does have. It may open up some opportunities maybe for you to get into some of those major courses a bit quicker. Um, that's certainly advantage to validating a lot of classes early on. Kelly, if I could just add to that, you don't have to do four years of Army ROTC. If you transfer it to our school, um, you can come in as a sophomore or even as late as the junior year. There are some prerequisites to that. So um, just as a little option B uh, to those that are thinking of transferring from another college. I will also go on and add, um, so just because we don't accept an AP course or college course as a transfer credit, doesn't mean, okay, don't do it. Um, those are the courses that are really going to aid in the competitive nature of your application because they're going to show us that you can operate at that higher educational level. So don't think that doesn't count for nothing. It absolutely counts just in a different way than maybe your more traditional college or university. Um, Emily, I'm going to follow up with that because um, one person did ask if their school only offers a limited amount of advanced classes, um, APs and honors, do the academies take that into account or consideration? Sure. So I'll go ahead and kick it off and I'll let our, my counterparts kind of add in. Um, but we're never going to hold something against you for what your school does. So a lot of the academies, um, they're going to look at your school profiles. A lot of guidance counselors will include that um, with your transcript, give us an understanding of where you're at, and we will take that all into consideration. A fabulous other tip that we can add is if you want to go the extra mile, once again, like I said, won't count it against you, but we do have a number of students who their schools won't offer AP or IB courses. So they'll kind of opt to maybe do, if they're able financially or things of that nature, um, community college courses on the side to further boost their application. But once again, that's an extra tidbit. We understand everyone's situation is different. So doing the best with what you have available to you and going above and beyond in other ways is going to really ultimately bring you to the forefront in the competitive nature of your application. And remember, Academics are very important, but holistic application review too. We're gonna to take into consideration a number of factors. Well, and I can also let you know that when your school is sending us the transcript, they're also gonna send us um, basically a school profile. So as admissions counselors, we actually can see how many AP courses usually, um, how many honors courses, um, and again, just like um, Emily spoke about, we take all those things into consideration. Kelly, if I can jump on just in to follow up with Emily's holistic application point. Um, I failed to mention it before, but uh, we get a lot of questions um, as admissions, and I'm sure all of you do as well. In the, in the days of old, you used to put 40 types of clubs or anything you could get on your resume. And I will tell you now that it is strongly encouraged that you pursue fewer of those and yet show a leadership role within the clubs that you participate in rather than be a member of every club but not really contribute to it. 
So though the opportunity to have a leadership role in any of those or be a strongly contributing member and be able to prove that shows way better than having 40 different clubs listed on your resume. And I think that's where that question came in earlier too about Civil Air Patrol, JROTC, um, you know, things that we see also are Eagle Scout, Gold Award, um, Boys State, those kind of programs. So yes, I, I can only, you know, um, vouch for what Jen said in terms of most of our students even have two or three things extracurricular, um, but they do have a leadership position, you know, in, in one or two of them. Um, we have a question about attending an academy or ROTC program. Does college major affect possible careers in the military? Can I, I, I can answer part of that right now, uh, Kelly. So yes and no is, is the answer. If you're pursuing nursing or something in the medical profession and we're preparing you for an educational delay to continue your education, either for law school or any of the medical professions, then yes, your undergraduate degree certainly applies towards your profession within the Army. And I'm speaking only for the Army. Uh, for everything else, no, it's fr I call it free play. Uh, I was a finance major. I didn't go into the Army's finance corps. I wanted to fly helicopters, and that's what I did. So they didn't typecast me based on my major. You don't have to be an engineer if you have an engineering degree. Uh, you obviously have a close inside track on pursuing that branch in the Army based on your degree plan, but it's not a requirement, so. Yeah, to um, to cap, to go on to Mr. Fahey's point, I'm an engineer officer and, and I went to engineer Bullock. I have an engineering degree, but I would say 50% of my engineer Bullock class were, you name it, they, were, they had all sorts of degrees. Um, yeah, having a STEM degree definitely helps in far the, as far as the OML is concerned. Um, but once you're in the school, once you're in that branch, it, I had criminal justice majors, history majors, you name it. And so. I will, I will say coming from the Naval Academy side for the Navy part. Um, so ROTC and whether you go to a service Academy are, are different in that, in the, um, majors that you are allowed to take as well. So not that all of you who are applying don't know that, but just so you're aware. So at the Naval Academy, everyone graduates from a, with a bachelor of science, no matter what their major is. So you could be an English major, but you will graduate with a bachelor of science. Um, and sort of to answer the question that's all the way at the bottom. Um, so with that, from how hard is it to go from the Naval Academy or West Point to a medical school? Uh, one, you don't go directly from law school unless you choose an MOS in the Marine Corps as a JAG. Um, but for the medical officer, uh, it's really, really hard. So not that I don't wanna encourage people to go medical, uh, but this year they for the class of 2020, there were 15 students that selected medical corps out of 1,138. So um, I know I wasn't smart enough to do that, so, <laughs> but I will say um, that, that there are plenty of paths to get to the medical corps. Um, I will say federal service academies might not be the easiest path to get there. So just know that going into it. Yeah, I can speak more to on the Navy side as well. So if you're trying to go into one of the nuclear communities, so whether that's submarine or nuclear slow, so operating the reactor on a carrier, it is helpful to have a STEM degree. And ROTC, just like the Naval Academy, we like to award um, the majority of our scholarships to those who are pursuing STEM degrees. Um, but for instance, my first CO was a political science major. So it's not a requirement, but it will make you look more attractive to the submarine or nuke swell community, um, but that could be a bad thing too. So if you uh, if you want to go fly aircraft, um, you know they they might try to uh, pick you up for submarines. Okay, there's a couple of questions about small arms repair in the army. Not sure who wants to take that, but I have no clue. So, <laughs> probably touch on that one. So, I think I saw that he was a sophomore in high school. If I, if I read it right, but 
as a junior in high school at 17 years of age with both parents' permission, you could pursue the split training option. I would have to double check if 91 Fox, which is the MOS identifier for small arms repair. Uh, I don't know if that's a split train opportunity, um, but currently right now due to COVID, there is an exception to policy that allows a junior actually currently right now to enlist essentially as a senior and then they would go to basic training and advance individual training after they graduate their senior year. And as Brendan pointed out in the chat too, um, MOS stands for Military Occupation Specialty. Thank you, thank you Brendan. Um, there's a question about um, weight of high school in terms of technical high schools um, and I guess more traditional type high schools. I'm not sure who wants to grab that one if they're weighed any differently. I'll jump in in saying that I, um, I honestly don't know. I think a lot of it shows what classes you have taken and how those compare. Um, but to the earlier point uh, that was made by Emily, there are lots of things that happen across this country and, uh, and across Maine um, that there are opportunities given to some students that aren't to others. And so everything is open to consideration. Um, and I think part of that will also show how well you score on standardized testing. Um, and so if you are interested in serving the military, I highly suggest you apply. And I'll just add, uh, had NP. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> sorry. No, I'll just add for that. Uh, when you talk courses and stuff like that for the national process for ROTC applications, um, honors and AP courses are the ones that would, would kind of fleet you to the top in regards to the scholarship um, portion. So if you take, say, for instance, for example, if a student comes in and uh, for you out there, if you're all taking uh, honors or an AP course, even if you take a couple of those courses, that will automatically give you a couple additional points up to, I believe, Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, 10 points uh, towards your overall score of 200. Uh, that includes my interview as well as your transcripts, varsity sports and athlete, uh, athletics. And so there's a wide variety of things within the national ROTC scholarship process. Uh, so just to kind of touch on that question, uh, more AP and honors courses or which will provide you extra points for that uh, scholarship application. I'll go ahead and add to the fact that, um, so once again, like I previously said, we're not going to hold things against you just because of the opportunities you've been um, set up with. However, a lot of perks of technical schools is the fact that you're currently studying something a little bit more specific. So I will say from applications I have reviewed, um, those who come from technical schools, an example being engineering, they're doing something engineering related, they're applying into an engineering major, and then we can really see that they were able to do well in those engineering specific courses, and they would fit well into our engineering specific courses. So however you kind of piece together your application and set yourself up for success. And really, it, it's a whole storybook. Think of it, you know, as a chapter book where you're showcasing all of your strengths and abilities to get you to that final end goal. So piece it so that it matches everything you want to do. It matches why you want to come to the academy. It matches what you want to study at the academy. And then even if you have an idea of what you want to do past the academy, it can match that as well. And I think that can apply to any program that you're applying into, whether it's ROTC or academy specific, but really think of what you've done, what you're currently doing, what you're looking to do and flow it all together like a storybook. So we've had a few questions about interviews um, and the process. Can you each talk about um, how that works at your academy or in the NROTC in terms of who do they contact? Is it a blue and gold or a, you know, an, an ALO who does the interview um, and how you kind of go about that and how that figures into um, whether you're accepted or not? At, um, at West Point, it is a requirement now. It didn't used to be, but it is now. And the field force, uh, well, if you, tend, if you attend SLE, the summer leader program, you, the um, interview will be conducted at that time. Uh, but if you are not accepted at SLE or if it's not being held, um, the field force representatives conduct the interviews. I did several this year, obviously, by Zoom. And 
I then write up a report that I submit to the admissions office and it, it is a requirement now uh, of the admissions packet. For, uh, for ROTC uh, portion for the Army National Scholarship uh, applications, it is a requirement. Uh, any PMS across or professor of military science across the country can do those interviews. Uh, so if you're in the state of Maine, but you're looking at going to uh, say your first uh, choice is the University of Southern California, you can still come into my office and I can do that interview process for you, upload it into our uh, database, and then that will go and complete your packet. Uh, and then a majority of ours were done via Zoom as well as in person for local students here. Uh, as well, but that is part of the interview process, but it can be done with any uh, professor of military science across the country. I will, I will jump in and say for the Naval Academy, it's also required. The interview is a required part of it. Um, and very often we have definitely done it with the University of Maine in the past. Um, sometimes we can even cross both for ROTC and for service academies uh, interviews if needed. So if you have a question with those, please make sure you reach out to your, your different um, school affiliates and we can make that happen. As you see, we do know each other, so we can certainly try and make that. We wanna make sure you guys get your best foot forward. And so we will do our very best to help you do that. For the Coast Guard Academy, um, it, so a little bit different than the other academies and programs is we wish we could have an interview for every single student. However, we unfortunately don't have the manpower to do so. So instead what we do is we kind of have a lottery basis where students are randomly selected for interviews. So we interview, this past year we interviewed the most of the applicant pool that we've ever interviewed before. Um, and sometimes that happens during our academy introduction mission. So all students who attend that summer program will receive an interview. And so be prepared for that. And then we also do it throughout the application process itself. And it's either virtual or over the phone in the COVID environment. So if you are selected for an interview, fantastic. If you're not, don't worry. It doesn't mean that you know, you're any more ahead um, than another student in that application process. And Naval ROTC is very similar to Army. So it's a requirement for the application process and you will typically interview with your local, whatever ROT, Navy ROTC unit is local to you. Uh, but in this environment, we've been doing a lot of virtual interviews for students across the country. And you'll be sitting down with our CO, our PNS, or our XO to do that interview. At the Merchant Marine Academy, uh, there is not a required interview. Um, as a field rep living here in Maine, um, I'm always here to help students with the application process, but there is not an interview requirement. And there are interviews required, as Sarah mentioned, for the nomination, congressional nomination process. So um, it actually is, is um, good, in, good practice for the other interview that you're going to have to do later, but you'll, those are set up by the, the, off, the uh, congressional delegation offices. Sarah, um, there was also a question about um, initiating the application for the congressional nomination. Um, and if there is an initial one, or do they just complete the application? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, if uh, students hop on our individual websites, uh, Senator Collins, King, and Representative Hingree and Golden, whichever your representative happens to be, we each have our own application, their individual applications. Um, and you'll see information there about the requirements and the deadlines once again. Um, and uh, there'll be a link to our application. So um, everything should be there that you need. Uh, we do share information amongst each other. So if you've applied to one of our offices, not the others, we we rat you out. <laughs> and uh, so we do want you to apply to each office that's really important you do that um but we do you know, we do talk to each other and if um, we're missing something we do share information but um everything should be there and also our email addresses should be on our websites as well on our nomination pages 
So you can email us or call, our phone numbers are there, call us anytime you have a question. We love to hear from students um, who are just even thinking about applying and have a question. Um, we like to provide guidance and we like to hear from you early on so we can get to know you. Um, it's fun for us to get to know you over the summer. And we look forward to hearing from you. And we can also help you along the way if you're having trouble getting information, um, getting all of your letters of recommendation and you're getting stuck on something. We'd rather hear from you early on and, and start receiving information from you over time, over the summer, than have you try to send everything in, wait to every, every piece of information, send a full application because you might get hung up on something. So um, if you're just missing one thing, we can always help you try to get that piece of information, we're happy to do it. So please uh, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you, I'm happy to help. Thanks for that question. So we have a question about class rank. Um, if their school does not rank, how do the academies factor that in? For the Coast Guard Academy, we just ask the guidance counselor to either give um, an idea of where the class rank would be or just a percentage. So where they fall in the percentile of the class. I will say, speaking frankly, if you do not have a class rank in your high school, our admissions office uh, is still gonna request your high school transcript. And with that, that may come with um, clarifying questions um, with, you know, with these classes, where would you fall? Um, very similar uh, to what was previously previously said about the Coast Guard Academy. So uh, the importance of sending in your transcripts with your grades and your guidance counselor information uh, will help our admissions team maybe determine uh, where you might fall. Okay, is there any um, suggestion in terms of taking early college courses over AP courses, um, you know, in terms of how they wait in the application process? Is one better than the other? Uh, I'll jump in and I don't really think so. Um, I think you should pick courses that are challenging for you. Um, I think they can see both when your transcript comes through, whether you have challenged yourself. I mean, if you could get the easy A and only take the course of getting the easy A when you could have taken a more challenging course, um, that will also come out. So I also don't think you should drown while you're doing it. So, uh, but there is no true preference from one to the other. It's everybody's in an individual and I, it's not that they would say, oh, well, they're taking a college course versus AP courses, um, at least not at the Naval Academy. I would just suggest looking at the schools you're applying to outside of the academies, if you're looking at your senior military colleges or just other schools where you're applying for an ROTC scholarship. Um, VMI, for example, we take transfer credits, AP credits, um, we, we take dual enrollment credits, but for an AP class, we do require that you have a uh, four or five on the AP test. So each school is a little different there. So for us, we're gonna take that grade from the dual enrollment class without the test, more so on how you're doing in the class. But on the AP side, we require AP test score. So each school is a little bit different there. If your school is gonna require an AP test, it may be um, more beneficial and make more financial sense to take the dual enrollment side. To actually follow up with that too, um, since we're talking about um, taking those uh, advanced classes, um, one student did have a question about um, everyone being an advanced um, in, at an advanced high school. Um, everyone has extremely high GPAs and they all take honors. Um, so they're not in the top 10. Do the academies take this into account when they look at the class rank? Um, do they look at the, basically the strength of the school? Kelly, <clears throat> Kelly. Yes, Blake. Blake right. Bartlett. <clears throat> My contact information by phone is 207-621-1010. And when you, when I answer, use the expression Navy information that separates you from the robos. 
Yes. And so Blake is answering one of the questions in the chat for his contact information. So he is the blue, blue and gold office of for Bangor. So I hope you all caught that, but it's being recorded if you aren't. So uh, don't worry. The whole world will now have it, Blake. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. She well, answered the previous question. Oh, did I step over someone? <laughs> Uh, okay, fantastic. So to answer the previous question about, you know, hey, I go to a school with students who are all rock stars and it, you know, kind of takes away from how rock star I am. Um, one, that's fantastic. And two, we do take into account, we ask, at least at the Coast Guard Academy, your guidance counselor provides one of your letters of recommendation. And in doing so, they fill out a cover letter and they provide some info on your school. This includes, yes, your class rank, your unweighted GPA, things of that nature, but also info about the school specifically. And that point right there that would kind of help answer your question is um, we ask the percentage of students who go on to attend a four-year college or university. So that usually gives us insight into the competitive nature of your school. That also being said, a lot of us admissions officers, um, so we're usually here for three to four years at a time and we really get to know our region. So we generally know those schools within our region. We have an understanding of how competitive each school is. So, um, you know, I know just because you're maybe in the top 25% versus the top 10%, don't worry, we're really looking at those grades, the courses you did take and how you did in them. Okay, so we have a, a question about hazing um, at the academies as well as sexual assault and in terms of are these problems um, and, and could we, I guess, address these at our different institutions? I'll go first and be the brave one, I guess, here. Um, yes, unfortunately, you know, these events do occur. Uh, they are isolated incidents. But at the same time, um, at least in, I'll speak on sexual assault first. In regards to, you know, those sexual assault incidences that do occur, we have a ton of resources for cadets at the Air Force Academy to utilize in order to get them the help that they need, you know, when those events do occur. We have the Peak Performance Center specifically for cadets um, that allows them to um, either uh, report restricted or unrestricted um, reportings of these events, also assist them medically, emotionally, whatever, whatever it is that they need. You know, you also have your chain of command that's obviously right there, um, you know, your fellow cadets. You have a great support system at our academy, at a lot of the service academies, at all of the service academies for that matter. Um, but yes, when they do happen, you know, we, we tend to rally around those individuals and, and make sure they have what they need. Um, in regards to hazing, that's certainly not a term we like to use anymore at the service academies or at our service academy specifically. Um, and there has actually been a lot of sweeping changes at USAFA recently um, in the way that we look at training and how we go about training. Um, with that in mind, um, we've looked at a lot of what we consider maybe traditions and have determined whether or not those are necessary in order to develop leaders of character and commission second lieutenants into the Air Force. So, just jump in real quick, just in general, talk about the military and sexual assault, sexual harassment. Uh, it's been in the news a lot lately and uh, it has been for quite some time and it just doesn't seem to go away. Um, and for good reason, it continues to be an issue, but it's an issue everywhere. It's an issue all through society in a lot of different ways. But I can, one thing that I can say pretty comfortably is that there is nobody that tries harder and works harder at, uh, at taking the proper steps as the military does. And I think that's the case in all the services. Um, you see the new Secretary of Defense, one of his priorities under his people category is sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, that's, the, that's a high priority of every, serv every service that's out, that's out there now. So, uh, you know, if I'm a parent and I'm thinking about my kids, um, you know, there's a lot of things to be concerned about. And there are a lot of things that, uh, that, that, uh, that happen everywhere, but I think the military uh, I, I'm proud of what the military has done over the years to try to combat that. And when it comes to things like hazing, you know, one thing I can pretty much guarantee around the military is that when, when, whether you call it initiation, whether you call it training, whatever you call it, there's always senior 
uh, supervisors and leaders that are involved in it. Now, are mistakes made? There's a good chance there may be mistakes made, but all you got to do is turn on the news and see some of the stories of what goes on everywhere. And I and I think that uh, you know a lot of the a lot of other places that you have that type of thing go on uh, has a lot less supervision. So uh, I'm pretty I'm pretty uh, I think you can be pretty safe to think that the military is at least doing more than most uh, organizations uh, to uh, to combat all those types of things. I, I agree with General Farnham and, and you know, having it happen in other places isn't isn't an excuse, but I will say as well um, that, you know, there's a spotlight on the military and academy. So you're going to hear about those incidences that you're not going to hear necessarily at other locations. So um, all the academies are addressing these issues. Uh, hazing isn't isn't something that, you know, if, if you're thinking about the term that we should used back many, many years ago, um, that that stuff doesn't occur anymore. And is, um, but um, I, I think you can feel my, I have two daughters at the academy right now. And I know that um, they're in very good hands. And there's a lot of training that goes on all the time. And I'll add that for the Coast Guard too. Um, in addition to everything you heard in regards to resources, training, um, it's just also not tolerated. So whenever something of that nature does come up, it's taken extremely seriously. Um, so it's something that we do know. And I myself being a young female, I can say in the Coast Guard itself, I have never had any feelings of either. And, you know, I understand and identify though that I'm blessed in not experiencing anything of that nature. But it is something that I do feel the majority of the people you're going to meet are going to be supportive and hopefully you know you won't encounter one of those individuals who is there to inflict ill harm okay so i'm going to switch back to a, a question we had uh, significantly earlier in the program um regarding medicals um dodmer medicals um basically they were asking about um you know uh is there one medical for all? Um, so yes, all academies and ROTC, but would you wanna talk about the differences in terms of what your waiver authorities um, kind of allow in terms of you know what's a DQ medically for, for Navy that's not for West Point or vice versa? Uh, so since you teed me up, Kelly, I will start. Uh, our waiver process is its own endeavor and it is an automatic process. I will tell you the biggest point of concern or consideration where the Navy is concerned is colorblindness. It is not something you can fix. And it is the only thing I am comfortable in saying is probably your biggest disqualification factor. Uh, beyond that, um, that is something that is entirely determined by both Dodmer and the Medical Corps at the Naval Academy. So as you apply to the Naval Academy, <laughs> again, unless you are colorblind, then um, once you apply to those, and if you go through, like I have a friend that I played with there that had two ACL surgeries prior to showing up to Annapolis and then still was commissioned as an F-18 pilot. So um, that process will go on. And I will tell you from the Navy side of life, blue and gold officers have no control over the medical side. So with that, we will do our very best to get you in touch with the medical um, folks at Annapolis, if that's true. But the waiver process, if you are going to be gifted or granted a waiver, will be an automatic role from Dobmer um, in, in Annapolis. And I'll, I'll chime in really for the ROTC portion of it. And, and again, with Mr. Fahey on the line, uh, the medical process is a little bit different for ROTC is that there's not one process uh, that is done at the beginning of the, of the application process. So where the service academies are doing medical determinations prior to uh, acceptance, and I, I don't want to go out and speak for all the academies, but ours are done on the backside. So you would be awarded the scholarship opportunity, come to the university, and then we would start the medical process there. Now there is physical requirements that are that are um, or, or tests and, and examinations that are required prior to uh, where you do a physical assessment to make sure you're qualified for the scholarship. But once you come onto campus, then we start that process. And the the delay on that could, uh, you know, if there's things that aren't uh, disclosed at the beginning, um, could prove problematic. So you know, come with an open kind of this is this is my medical history. Go through your process. 
uh, and then our waiver process goes up through cadet command uh, and then is turned back uh, to us and and chase if you have anything else with like vmi and the service academies and stuff or the uh, senior military colleges uh, yeah just to just to kind of go on with that your senior military colleges are going to have a completely separate medical side than the rtcs so at vmi um, we don't do any of the medical part as part of the application or any of the physical part. Um, there's a height and weight um, sliding scale. But other than that, we look at your medical history after you're accepted. Um, we don't make any kind of a, a appointment or acceptance based on that. Now, I will tell you, we have had students that, like you said, they've came in after the fact and there has been something that's came up that's disqualified them from one branch um, and has allowed them to switch over to another branch that that they could get a waiver from. Um, our, our commandant of our, our cadets right now um, came in on, our, on a, on a uh, Navy Marine ROTC scholarship in the late 80s and um, was disqualified because he was colorblind um, and commissioned in the Army. So there, that is a, a benefit of the senior military colleges and the multiple ROTCs being in one place when if something comes up on your medical side that disqualifies you from one branch that you can get a waiver from in the other. Um, we, we do have that with, with our students as well. So there was also a question regarding sports camp, um, athletic recruitment. Um, can you guys talk about how that works at your individual institutions in terms of if a student wants to be a recruited athlete or thinks they're going to be um, playing um, and how they get in touch or are there sports camps that they can go and be viewed at? Most of us that are, were, um, that are representing the service academies provided links within the chat um, for the recruits who, if so, if you have an interest in being a recruited athlete and they haven't reached out to you, there's a, you can visit the websites that um, we provided in the, in the chat. Um, as far as, um, sport like sport camps um right now west point of course is not holding any of those sports camps and and the ages range from young kids all the way through high school um and i also posted the link to those camps in the in the chat as well uh the same same with vmi and, and really the citadel if you're interested in sport and you haven't heard from the coach um, don't be afraid to email the coach um, or go onto their website. And one of the assistant coaches may be a recording recruiting coordinator. Um, I will tell you to not, don't be overwhelmed if a coach does not get right back to you. Um, there's NCAA dead periods that are out there um, to where coaches can't have contact with you. Um, if you're on campus, they can't see you. Um, there are different rules with the NCAA that are out there that they have to um, abide by as well. Um, we are not, if, if we're doing any camps this summer, they will be strictly day camps. Um, we, there may be some, some this summer, um, but with that, just contact the coach. Coaches are doing, I think, I think COVID has opened up some coaches eyes on, they're recruiting a little bit differently and able to see students differently than they were in the past. Um, a lot of your travel ball tournaments, baseball, um, you know, all sports, they are broadcasting those. So, you know, coaches are able to watch a long list of students uh, without traveling to one place to watch maybe a handful. So that that's a big change that I, I think you'll see this, this summer and as part of the recruiting process. But again, just email that coach directly um, and, and let them know that you're interested, um, depending on your sport, kind of have your information ready. Um, if you're track and field, have your times ready um, and, and things like that, because they're, they're going to want to know those things. Um, following up on that, um, visit opportunities this summer or um, how are each of you working the opportunities to get in touch with or see the different campuses? I know right now at the Air Force Academy, we are offering what's called windshield tours, where you can come onto campus, drive around in your vehicle in a, a self-guided tour around the campus to at least give you an opportunity to see what the campus looks like. Unfortunately, we're not doing in-person um, tours on campus yet, but we are hosting weekly webinars 
that you can also find um, via our admissions website. I'll actually try to post the link here in the chat. For the Coast Guard Academy, we are also still close to visitors. However, we do have a number of virtual events that we are offering. So we do do virtual admissions briefs um, every month on both Tuesday and Saturday options. So you have kind of different times and days to play off of. And then um, we also do a number of our other regular in-person experiences virtually that we've kind of turned in. So our cadet for days, things of that nature. And of course, as with everyone, as soon as it's safe to do so, we'll bring visitors back on campus. But I will say, I know students are probably sick of hearing it, but we do have a really fabulous virtual tour and virtual career tour that's on our website as well. And we're currently in the process of remaking the virtual tour too with even more updated information. So always something that's fun to look at. I will say the Coast Guard Academy is only 103 acres in size, so we can't offer a fabulous windshield tour as the Air Force Academy can, but um, these are great alternatives. For the uh, ROTC department up here at the University of Maine, we, we are open for business in regards to, to teaching uh, in, in person and in classroom instruction. Uh, Huston University as well is doing uh, uh, in-house uh, uh, events like new student events and orientation. Everything's limited in scope and size due to, to CDC requirements and everything like that following that protocol. Uh, but we do also host uh, visits to our uh, area of operations here within the, uh, the university as well as we do facilitate uh, general walk arounds of the university. Uh, but again, there are levels of colleges, whether it's the uh, engineer business or something like that, that have individual uh, requirements as well. So you may not be able to meet with your major but you'll be able to walk around the university uh, in a safe environment uh, and, and at least get a lay of the land. West Point is, is doing virtual tours, but they're also allowing some visits. There are, but there are certain requirements um, also like ROTC limited. Um, you have to have an open up application. You have to be a senior. Um, you can only bring one family member with you and you have to complete a COVID um, survey and so there's a, there's uh, some limitations to it, but um, and it's it's not like you're walking around wherever you want. It's a very specific tour. But um, if you visit the website under admissions, there's a, a visiting West Point um, page that you can check out. Uh, the Merchant Marine Academy is is still closed um, at this time, but uh, contacting the admissions office, um, you should be able to talk with. Uh, the New England coordinator and be able to um, have some information through through that contact. Well, I'll take it back real quick that the Naval Academies is almost identical to West Point's. Yeah. We're we're similar to um, there at at Maine. Um, we are. You can come on post. Um, you can you can drive around. You can actually schedule in person interviews with your admissions officer. Um, we're also doing virtual versions of those, but if you are on campus, we're doing a very limited amount of those. Um, one in the afternoon, one in the evening, we're disinfecting in the rooms in between. Um, but just, you can schedule those. Um, and then we are planning on having some version of an in-person um, recruiting event in the fall. Um, we, we were able to do it this past fall. Um, again, very limited numbers. So just keep an eye out on the websites of all the schools um, because when they open, they're gonna be pretty pretty limited on the numbers. So I can also reiterate at Maine Maritime Academy, we are doing in-person um, admissions visits as well as a student-led tour. We're not going into any buildings, um, you know, but it will give you the opportunity to see campus and talk to a student. We do have the opportunity for virtual events as well. Um, I am really hoping this fall, we will be able to do this service academy night um, down in the Portland area. So traditionally our fall events for service academy night is in Portland and our spring event is typically in Bangor. Um, so do you know be on the lookout for that. Um, we haven't set a date yet, but Sarah always gets me, uh, you know, gets us sometime in September. Um, usually kind of mid-September is when we will do that. Um, so, you know, um, we are getting close to the end of tonight's program. Um, I do see that, of course, there's two more questions that just popped up. Um, and can you apply to both Navy ROTC and ROTC for selective colleges such as Harvard? 
And if you are fortunate enough to get both um, admissions to the school and an ROTC scholarship, could you hold off on accepting until you hear back from the academies? So I, you know, um, how does that work? I mean, I know the timing is usually, um, you know, we, we try to time everything, but can one of you talk about that? So the timing is entirely, um, or the, um, it's dependent, uh, it's dependent on, um, honestly, the school on how it is going versus an ROTC, ROTC scholarship versus um, an appointment, uh, specifically for the Naval Academy. The Naval Academy will not necessarily wait for the ROTC, uh, but the ROTC may wait for the Naval Academy and that is entirely school dependent, individually dependent. So I, I wouldn't even begin to speak for Harvard uh, <laughs> in that regard. Ellie, if I could just say uh, to add to that, um, it, there is a very short window of time where there's a, a, a moment of indecision or you're really not quite sure you've been accepted to the academies just yet, or there's other things laying out like a medical issue. I, I don't know, but bottom line is you can apply up to seven colleges for an Army ROTC scholarship. You still have to apply to that college and be accepted to it, but usually you may receive an offer to up to three colleges. Uh, so it could be Harvard, MIT, and the University of Maine, and now you get to choose one of those. But at the same time, you're still waiting to hear. Uh, we, I think, it have more flexibility on the ROTC side of the house. I'll help, we, we'll help you with that um, to see if you can wait um, on your final decision. But all these schools, the prestigious ones, one May is the deadline. You have to let them know this is what you're going to do. So a lot of this is you, you're weighing it against the school policy as well. The one other thing that, um, and, and we stress to our students, Brendan, is you can also apply for multiple ROTC scholarships. You can apply for, yeah, um, you, you, you don't, you, if you apply for the Army ROTC scholarship, you can also apply for Air Force ROTC scholarship as well as you choose Navy or Marine, but you can apply for three. Um, and we suggest that our students do that because um, if, if it can help, if you're planning on, planning on serving your country um, and one of them offers you a scholarship, they may be at the that may make that decision a little easier for you. And I'm gonna end on a doozy. So we do have that question about COVID vaccines. Um, so do we recommend that prospective students get COVID vaccines before attending or if there's any policies in place? I can go ahead and kick it off for the Coast Guard Academy. Um, then answering this question, more than once so far. So I feel confident in it. And we also just had our superintendent, Rear Admiral Kelly, answer it to a handful of students. So this week I got to witness that. Um, so right now the vaccine is not mandated by the Coast Guard itself, which means it's not mandated for students to get it. Our entire Corps of Cadets was um, offered the vaccine this past week. And I believe 99% opted in. So 99% did opt in to receive the vaccine. If not, maybe even 100% come time um, within this next week is what Real Admiral Kelly had shared. That being said, we do say, you know, if you're able to get it before coming to the Academy for Swab Summer, it is encouraged uh, just for the sake of everything kind of moving forward. However, that is also a choice that you have to make. That is up to you. It is not mandated, not required at this point in time. So we respect that decision and that's the whole outlook for our entire service. So we have a lot of Coasties who opt to get it. Um, I'd say more opt to get it than those who opt out. However, those who opt out, we respect that decision and no one is um, discriminated against for it. And I can honestly say that because I work with people who have it and people who don't. Um, so highly encouraged, although understand personal preference and everyone has their own medical reasons or other things of that nature. And that's where I'll leave it. I will say though, I will put in a little tidbit. You are looking at joining military services. So generally military services do have vaccine mandates. And once this does switch over to a mandated vaccine, then this conversation will change a little bit. So that is something to take note of. However, right now that is not the case. I think Emily said it best, um, strongly encouraged, but not mandated. Um, and, and obviously, as we have all seen throughout this year, 
um, things are changing and they're changing on a daily basis. Um, so with that being said, we are over the um, eight o'clock time. Um, you know, I know we, we've all thank you so much for, for participating, for giving up, um, you know, your evening. Um, I hope this showed to the students on here how much we are here to support you. Um, and again, I mean, we are all great opportunities. Um, you know, we want to help you find the right one for you. Um, thank you, Sarah. And uh Congressional staffers, thank you um, to all the service academies as well as the ROTCs and Major General, thank you always for being here um, and supporting our student and our state. Um, thank you everyone. Good luck to everyone. Good luck to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.